And so tonight, uh, we continue in our study on the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are now in section two of that letter, which is the blessings of our position in Christ. The blessings of our position in Christ. And that runs again from chapter one and verse three. It goes all the way to chapter three and verse 21. So where we began in our last lesson on last, last Wednesday was we began with number one, which is we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Now that will run from verses three all the way through to verse 14. And there we learned how God has blessed us. He's bestowed benefits upon us who are in Christ. Amen. And so what we are blessed with is we are blessed with all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And we took a look at that and I said, you know, the church needs to focus a little more on what we have in Christ spiritually. Some of these spiritual blessings, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption that we have, the fact that we've been given his Holy Spirit. We were chosen people, predestined for a purpose. Uh, we are given wisdom and knowledge and insight into the mysteries of God and all these great and wonderful things. Because in the modern church, what are we always focused on? We're always focused on the material things, material blessings. And there are greater things than the material blessings that we have in Christ, and we're seeing those things here right now. But everything the believer possesses is in Christ. It is found nowhere else but in Jesus Christ. This is the way in which God has blessed us. He has blessed us through his son. And when we put faith in his son, we receive all the provision that God has provided for us in Christ. And when we find ourselves in Christ, we have all that is in Christ. Amen. So we continue with this teaching now, uh, tonight, as we are going to begin to now look at the seven spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And so we start this evening in verse 4, where Paul writes, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Okay, so just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before before him. So the first thing we're looking at and the first spiritual blessing is the fact that we have been chosen in him. We are chosen in Christ. And so what we're talking about here is the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election is what is referred to in this verse when Paul says he chose us in Christ. Now, this doctrine on election is, you know, the reason for many debates and divisions in Christianity. There are more arguments and divisions based on this doctrine than I think than anything else. You have people who separate over this and will not have any dealings with anyone that doesn't hold to their point of view on this doctrine. They will even look at them as being heretics or not even being a part of the body of Christ or being a brother or sister in Christ. And this is really unfortunate because, you know, it's divided the church so much that these two sides will not even work together. But rather, what they'll do is they'll attack one another. So instead of coming together and doing the work of the kingdom, doing the things that God's called us to do, to unite as the body, um, they decide to just argue about these things and divide over it. And it's unfortunate that it is that way because it shouldn't be. And so what we are divided over is what the doctrine of election really means. And so, first of all, the word chosen here, it means to pick out, to select, or to choose for oneself. Again, the word chosen here means to pick out, to select, or to choose for oneself. So what this verse says is that God chose us in him. God did the choosing. He did the picking. He did the selecting. He chose us for himself. Okay? Now, the us, obviously, is speaking about believers. Okay? The us doesn't refer 
to the whole world here. It refers to believers. It refers to those who are in, in Christ. And so the in him, of course, in this verse, refers to our position in Christ by faith. The moment that we put faith in Jesus Christ, we are united with him, and we are identified with him now. And so we have been, he has chosen us in Christ. And so our election as being in Christ and the fact that we now belong to God as believers, okay, that's what is referred to as our position. The fact we now belong to God as believers. God has chosen, he's picked out, he has selected for himself a people whom he would save, okay? Now, the problem that arises with this doctrine is this. Did God choose some people to be saved and not others? Okay, did God choose some and not others? So what happens is the ones who take this view, there are ones who take this view and say that God selected, God chose certain people whom he wanted to save, but he left the others alone. So in other words, he picked, I want this one, I want that one, that one, and that one. The rest, I'm leaving to go on their own path, and they'll end up being in hell. Or if you take the extreme view, they would say he chose certain ones for salvation, and the others he chose to go to hell. Okay? That is one view. And it, it does. And what happens is, is that side of it puts the focus on the sovereignty of God, where God is the one who's in control of this, and it has nothing to do with the free will of man. Okay? So the other side is, is that others will say that salvation is based on a person's faith. Okay? The work that God does in both instances, okay, in both viewpoints, is that God sends his son. Jesus Christ comes, God the Father sends him to die on the cross to take care of the sin problem for everybody. Okay? Now, and according to the view that we would hold, which is that we base it on a person's faith. Salvation is based on a person's faith. Now, the work is that God sends the Son, but it is up to us whether we will receive it or not. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, right? For by grace you have been saved. By grace. Through faith. Right? Not of works that anyone should boast. So it's not something that we work for. It's not something that we, that we earn. Okay? But it is grace. And it really is the gift of God, this salvation. But there is a way in which that it is received. And it is received through faith. So this debate, and so that side of it would focus then on man's free will. The one side focuses on the sovereignty of God. God's in control. God's in power. He chooses who he wants. The other side, we say, we focus on the free will of man. Okay? In his choice, he has to choose whether to accept Christ or to reject Christ. So this debate has been going on. It's going to continue going on until the, the coming of Christ. But anytime we deal with this subject or any other subject, uh, where there are disagreements in the body of Christ, you know, we have to remember that we are still brothers in Christ. And we have to treat one another as such. We have to treat one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to deal with it in love. Okay? But the, the two schools of thought that we are talking about here is Calvinism and Arminianism. Okay? Calvinism follows... Um, John Calvin. The Armenians, they follow Jacob Arminius, okay? And Calvin and Armini Jacob Arminius, they were opposed to each other on these things. So Calvinism, again, would say that it is God's sovereign choice, and it's not a person's exercised faith that determines who the elect are. God chose a side from any external influences. It is solely based on on his free grace. So there's nothing in man that causes God to want to save them. 
There's nothing special about anyone that God chooses one over another, but it's just a free act of his will, and it's by his sovereign grace that he decides who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. Okay? That's the Calvinistic view. Arminianism is God's foreknowledge in advance of those who would repent of their sins and believe the gospel. So God foreseen all who would believe, and these are the ones that he chooses as his elect. So in eternity past, we already know that God had the redemption plan in place, right? It was before he even created anything. Jesus Christ, the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Okay, so the redemption plan is in place before even creation is there. So God already knows. He's already got a plan that he is going to save a people for himself. He already knows that when he creates man, that man is going to fall into sin. But he still decides to go ahead with the plan. And the reason why he knows this is because he gives man the free, the ability to choose for himself. He gives man free will. We have the ability to choose. He has not just made us robots. We're not just programmed to do certain things. But we are like God, where we can freely express ourselves. And this is what relationship is all about. Because if we come into a relationship with God, you know, God wants people who are going to freely love him and choose to love him and not be forced to love him. Well, if you take the Calvinistic view, then it's almost like they are forced to love God. Okay, and I'll get into a little bit more of that in a, in a second here. But in the other view, right, where it's based off of man's free will, man has the choice, okay? Man has the freedom now to express his adoration towards God, put his faith in God, love God, and have a relationship with him, not something that is just programmed or forced. So, God foreseen all who would believe. So what does he do? He sees in eternity past. He already knows who will be saved and who won't be. Not because he said, I'm going to save that one and not that one. It's because he's already foreseen it. He already knows. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything that's going to happen. There's no surprises with God. And so he already knows those who will put faith in him. And he says, those ones who will believe and those ones who will receive my son, who my son is the elect one, my son is my chosen one, and because they put faith in my son, and they identify with my son, and are united with my son, they will also be the chosen ones. They will be the elect ones, because they are in the elect one. My son, Jesus Christ. So, there is life only in the son. And we become the elect as we are united to the elect one, Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't a Calvinist or Arminius debate, okay? But we do need to deal with these issues, especially when we come to this section, because this is one of the verses that is used all the time in this argument. And it's my responsibility as a pastor to bring this up with you guys and to tell you guys about these things, because if you're watching Christian television, okay, there's all different sorts of people with different beliefs on Christian television, You'll have Baptists, you'll have Reformed Baptists, you'll have Charismatics, New Apostolic Reformation, you'll have Word of Faith, and then you'll have Pentecostals and others on there. And all have different viewpoints. Now, you can listen to them and be in agreement with about 90, 95% 90 of what those people say. But there's the other 5% where they're all in disagreement. And it can bring confusion into the body of Christ. So it's important that we learn about these things so that we can identify these things and we aren't all confused about what we're hearing and we have a proper understanding of the scriptures. So, <clears throat> so again, Calvinists would say that God chooses who would be saved and who will be lost. The extreme Calvinists would say that God elects the lost to hell. Okay, that's not the God that I know. Okay, the God that I know 
desires that everybody be saved. He desires that none perish, right? But that all would have everlasting life. They would all repent and come to faith in Christ. Not, you know, where he chooses just a few and says the rest are going to hell. To hell with you, right? It's like, <laughs> but the extreme Calvinists would say that. They would say he elects the lost to hell. But the moderate view, the moderate Calvinists would say that God just overlooks them and leaves them to their sin. So which again, the ultimate destination is where? It's, it's hell. They end up in hell anyway. Okay? So in their belief, God has chosen those who will be saved and they will be saved, they say. This is what they call irresistible grace. God pours his grace out on the elect, the one who he has selected out of the people of this world, out of the lost out of this world. He'll pour his grace out on them, and they cannot, res they cannot resist it. These people will be saved. Because what they'll also say is that the atonement is limited, and it's only those whom Christ died for. Okay? So what they'll say is that Christ's death was for a specific group of people, the ones who God selected, okay, and those whom he died for. So when you talk about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, they would say it's not talking about the whole world. It's talking about the world of the elect, the ones whom God chose. Now that's reading in something into the scripture that isn't there. Okay? It's, an, it's a mistake. It's, it, it's, it's not right. That's not what it is. When God said that he loved the whole world, okay, it meant he loved the whole world. Okay? Or as the Hallmans would say it, God showed his love in this way that he sent his son for the whole world. Right? Yeah, no exception. Everybody has the choice. Whosoever shall call. Okay, let's finish the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes on him shall be saved. Whoever believes. That doesn't leave anybody out. Everybody's got the opportunity, right? It's just, will they receive it or not? Will they receive or will they reject? So again, the decision is left up to themselves. And you make the right decision, you receive Christ, then what? You receive the benefits of that, right? You receive eternal life. You're saved. You'll be with Christ. You have eternal reward. But if you make the decision to reject Christ, then you're left to face the consequences of your decision, which will be eternal separation, which will mean you'll face the second death and you'll be in the lake of fire, which burns forever. But the choice is yours. God lays it in your hands. He says, here's what I've done for you. You have fallen, but I have made a way for you to be saved. It's a free gift. It's by my grace, not something you earn, not something you deserved. But I pour this out. I give this to you and make it available to you. So, the Calvinist believes in irresistible grace, that grace is irresistible. They believe that the atonement is limited. But now the Arminian believes in resistible grace, that grace can be resisted. This is why we go around and we, when we um, evangelize, we share the word, not everybody receives Christ. There are some people who are open to the message of the gospel. There's people who receive the message of the gospel, but there's others who reject. And they're rejecting by their own will. They have a free will. So they can, God will pour his grace out. God will do whatever he can to save them. But ultimately the decision comes to them. They can resist his grace. Because God doesn't overrule man's free will. He doesn't overrule our free will. He leaves the decisions up to us. Even, even as believers, we see this carried 
over into our Christian life. Because why then does he have to instruct us all the time to follow his word, to obey his word, right? To flee these things, to not have anything to do with that. Well, if we just followed everything that God said and we were programmed, right, to accept his salvation and to follow after him, well then, you know, free will isn't involved. We would just accept his grace and we would follow his path. But we notice that in the Christian walk, as we are walking with him, we are faced with decisions constantly. We are constantly faced with decisions every day. There are temptations that come our, our way every day. Will I give in to those temptations or will I refuse it? Whose decision is it? It's, it's my decision. It's my decision if I'm going to lose my temper. It's my decision. Um, you know, whatever it may be, whatever wrong choices and things that come into my head, it's my choice. I decide whether I'm going to act out that way or not. So it's, we have that freedom of choice even in our Christian walk. So he doesn't overrule our free will, but man is responsible to receive or reject the grace of God. The grace of God is given to all men equally, and Jesus died for all men, and all can receive salvation if they repent and if they believe. Now, I believe that the election is a corporate election, okay, that we're talking about here. And what I mean by this is that God chooses to have a people for himself, okay, a people. The corporate body of Christ, which is made up of individuals who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. These individuals are incorporated into the body of Christ through faith, and they receive all the benefits of this, posi of this position in Christ. So, um, the way it works is that God says, I'm going to save a people, a group of people, which I will call my church. I will call the body. Okay, Jesus says they will be my body. They will be my church. And this group of people will be made up of individuals who have freely made the decision to believe in my son. And so this election, the first election is Christ-centered. Okay? Jesus Christ is God's elect one, and he's often referred to it that way in Scripture. Isaiah 42 and 1, he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect. He's talking about the Son. And it's also, you can look up Matthew 12, 18, because it quotes that verse in Matthew 12, 18 as well. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 4, it says there, to, who, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus chosen by God. He's God's elect. He is God's chosen one. So Jesus is the foundation of our election. He's God's chosen or elect one. He is the head of the church. And when we believe in him, we become a part of the elect one. His election becomes what? Our election. Right? We become a part of the chosen one, the elect one. Just like his righteousness becomes our righteousness. His death becomes my death. I'm identified with him in his death. His resurrection is my resurrection. The life that I have now, I have, I have his life. It all comes from him and through my identification with him. I'm identified with Christ and all these things I have by faith in him. I want to quote to you uh, from the Fire Bible. Many of you have that Bible, something that we use here in this ministry. We use it in the school of ministry. And I quote this because they use the same source uh, that I use. I have this book that is in, in, in my library. It's written by Robert Shank. It's called Elect in the Sun. Okay? 
And they quote this in their article in the Fire Bible on page 2024 and 2025. And it says there that the elect are called the body of Christ. They're called my church, a people for his own possession. And they're called the body or the bride of Christ. And so in this way, election involves the entire community of those who become God's people. Okay? Again, this, remember how I said it's a corporate election. We're incorporated into, into Christ. So in this way, the election involves the entire community because we are a church. We are a body. Okay? And then it says, this community includes individual people only as they identify and associate themselves with the body of Christ, the church, through faith in Christ. Okay? So it is a community of people who identify and associate themselves with the body of Christ, the church, through faith in Christ. So we are the elect, and we are the chosen ones because of our faith in Christ. So this election is not a nameless, faithless, or faceless election, but rather God knows every person who will make up the body of Christ. He knows every single one of you. He knew who those group of people would be. The ones who he would call the church, the ones who he would call the body of Christ. He knew every individual that would make up that body before the foundations of the world. Because his choice is to have a people in Christ, the church. So, let me give you a definition of election. Election refers to God choosing before the foundation of the world to have a people in Christ who would be holy and without blame before him. Again, election refers to God choosing before the foundation of the world to have a people in Christ who would be holy and without blame before him. And of course, these people who find this election in Christ are those whom God foreknew would believe. So notice now in verse 4, we've looked at the election part. He chose us in him. But notice now it says before the foundation of the world. And so we know that this was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. As I said earlier, it was his plan to redeem mankind. It was no surprise that man would fall and that man would fall into sin. But God had this plan. He had this plan in place to save mankind. God would send his son to take our place, to be the sacrifice for our sins. And there's a reason why this plan was put in place. Because look at verse, verse 4 again. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before he created. We are already chosen in Christ for the purpose here that we would be holy and we would be blameless. This is the reason why he's chosen us now, that he would have a people, a people who fell into sin, a people who were separated from him, but who were first created in perfection. And he had a plan for them, but they fell, and they fell into sin. So this loving God, he pours out his mercy and his grace, and he's got this wonderful redemptive plan that he would restore this people, that he would save this people, and bring him back to the, his original intention for them. And he would bring them back to the perfection for which they were created. He would again make a people who were holy, a people who were blameless. This was his desire. You see, again, the Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Every single person, no matter how good a person thinks they are, they have sinned and they've fallen short of the glory of God. And so, 
in order for us to be made holy and blameless before him, we need help. We need help. We can't do it on our own. We can't save ourselves. We can't cleanse ourselves from our sin. You see, if we, if we try to save ourselves, we can't save ourselves. Because of sin, there's a penalty, right? We broke the law of God. And the law of God says that the soul that sinneth shall die. Right? The wages of sin is death. The law brings condemnation. There is a penalty. So because God's law has been broken and there is a penalty of death, then what? We all must face that penalty. We have all been judged. We'll face the judgment. We'll pay the penalty. And what will be the prison cell? We'll all get the sentence and we'll be put into the prison of the lake of fire. Right? It's a life sentence, an eternal life sentence. Okay? But we couldn't help ourselves. We couldn't do it. So what does he do? Because of his love, or in his love, he has given us grace and mercy. He pays the price so that we don't have to pay the price. The one who is perfect, the one who has no sin, there was no sin found in him. The one who is holy and righteous, the one who flung the stars into their place and created all the planets and created us and gave us life, humbled himself to the point that he says, I'm going to come down, I am going to leave the glories of heaven, I'm going to leave my glory. I'm going to humble myself and become like my creation. And I'm going to take their place. Because this penalty and this sin is against mankind because man has sinned. So I'll become a man and I'll die in their place. And I'll be able to die in their place because I'll be perfect. I won't sin. And I'll be able to go and pay pay the penalty for them because I won't have a penalty myself. Because Jesus Christ didn't break the law of God. Jesus Christ didn't sin. He had no sin found in him. He is a lamb without blemish. This is why he could become the sacrifice. This is why he could go to the cross. If he had any sin in him, he could not be the sacrifice for our sins. Because now he would be guilty himself of breaking the law of God and disobeying God and falling short. So, God in his love has given us grace and mercy. He pays the price for us in order that we don't have to. The plan of salvation involves making us holy, which means to be set apart and to be consecrated to God. God God wants us to be like him now. He comes down and he saves us and he says, I want a people who are holy. I want a people who are set apart, who are consecrated unto me, who are separated from sin, who are separated from the world and consecrate themselves unto me. That's why 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So as believers or the elect, we are to be separated from sin and our old pattern of life and be his holy people. And we know that there's two parts to holiness. Sanctification. I talk about this all the time. We just finished talking about this. So I won't spend much time on it. There is the positional holiness or righteousness. This is who God declares us now to be as a result of our faith in Christ. The Father sees us in in the Son. That is our position. And His righteousness or holiness has been imputed unto us. Because at the cross, there was a great exchange that took place. Jesus Christ bore our sin. He took our sin upon Himself. This is called imputed, imputed, okay? Imputation where his, our sins are put on his account and his righteousness is put on our account. It's the great exchange. 
And as a result of it now, we have this right standing before God. And God sees us in the Son again. It's our position in Christ, and he sees us holy. Sees us through the Son. He doesn't see me for who I am. He sees me whom I'm in. He sees me in the Son. And now this is why we say we are the righteousness of Christ. Because his righteousness has been imputed to us. And this position never changes. As long as we follow Christ, we have faith in Christ, we always have this position. We are righteous, we're holy in Christ. This is a righteousness and a holiness that I don't earn or deserve, but that is freely given to me, that gives me this right standing. But then there's also the practical side of it. The practical holiness and righteousness. This is where we begin to live according to our position. So he says we're holy. And now we have to walk it out. We must become who God has declared us to be in Christ. And this is a lifelong work. It's something that will go on through your whole life. It's a work of the Spirit in your life. And you and the Holy Spirit have to work in cooperation in order for this to happen. You have to cooperate with the Spirit of God. You have to yield to the Spirit of God. You have to abide in Christ so the Spirit of God can work in your life. You have to feed on the Word of God. So we have a part to play in this. And that side of it is a process where we work again in cooperation with the Holy Spirit to become more like Christ. So he says that we are chosen before the foundation of the world that we would be holy, but also that we would be blameless before him. To be blameless is to be free from sin, to be above reproach, and without blemish. So, this is exactly what God has done in Christ. God has saved us. God has cleansed us. God has given us a right standing before him. In other words, we are justified. We're given a perfect standing before him. We're blameless before God. We are not guilty there is no charge that can be brought against God's elect because he has made us blameless through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose in choosing us. Now you can see why Paul starts verse 3. You can begin seeing this, and we are only have dealt with the first one. But this is why Paul said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Amen. You can see why Paul begins to praise God now. Look at the wonderful work that God has done. This is a plan of God that was put in place before the foundations of the world. Amen. He wanted a people unto himself. He wanted his very own people who would be holy and blameless, who would be in his son. And he gave us all the freedom of choice. Gave us the ability, gave us the freedom to choose whether we would receive his son or not. It's all up to us. God cannot be blamed because God has done everything he can to save mankind. It's up to us whether we will choose Jesus Christ or not. The choice is ours. Amen? Amen. 